Hey guys, welcome to Elevated Systems. I'm your host CJ and I'm a PC guy. I've been a PC guy since I hobbled together my first i486 IBM clone back in 1990 to replace my Commodore 64. I've never really considered Mac, mostly because you couldn't really build them and I could never afford to buy one. But then Apple unveiled the M1 SoC and I was intrigued so over a year ago, I bought my very first Mac, and while I was extremely impressed with the huge performance of Apple's M1 silicon, especially its unmatched performance per watt, the eight core GPU and eight gigabytes of RAM in the base model Mac mini just didn't cut it for my creative studio workload. But now we have more cores, more memory, more height. The 2022 Mac Studio. Does this have the performance necessary to replace my $6,000 production workstation PC? Well, we're gonna find out. Over the course of the next month, I'll be shutting down my PC workstation and using this Mac Studio as my primary studio computer. I'll be doing all my video editing in DaVinci Resolve, Fusion, and After Effects, all my graphics work in Photoshop, doing all my audio capture and equalizing, and any video capture from third-party sources. I'll also be testing 3D design and animation and rendering projects in Blender, Maya, Fusion 360, SketchUp, and maybe some more. And which Mac Studio did I buy to do this? The spec'd out M1 Ultra? <laughs> no, this isn't the DreamWorks Studio here. I just make videos on the internet. This is the cheapest Mac Studio you can buy, the $2,000 M1 Max version. 10 CPU cores, 24 GPU cores, 16 core neural engine, 32 gigabytes of unified memory, and a 512 gigabyte SSD. I could probably benefit more from the 32 core GPU, but I got this one because I wanted to show you what the most affordable version could do. Now, there are those that'll argue that if you can afford $2,000, you can afford another 200 for more GPU or more memory, but those are probably the same people that say if you can't afford $4 a gallon gasoline, buy an electric vehicle. Now, the only coverage I've seen on this is the March 8th Apple announcement event. I haven't watched any of the reaction videos or any of the early reviews, so my point of view isn't influenced. But again, I did preview some of this in my community post, and I got a few comments on the form factor or design, and there are very good reasons for keeping the footprint of this exactly the same as the footprint of the Mac Mini. On the consumer side, there are hundreds of accessories, docks, and mounts that will still work nicely with this, but more importantly, on the commercial side, in professional studios, there are things like co-location racks and ingestion server racks that are specifically designed for this 7.7 inch squared form factor. This is one of the main reasons the Mac Mini has never changed externally. So if you have a 12-slot Mac Mini rack, you may still be able to fit four Mac Studios in it. Worst case is you have to replace the tray, not your entire rack system. As far as its features, it's pretty straightforward. Four Thunderbolt 4 ports, 10G Ethernet, two 5GB Type-A ports, HDMI 2.0, and a high-impedance headphone jack. The front has two 10GB Type-C ports and a full duplex SD reader. And this M1 Max version weighs 5.9 pounds, which is exactly two pounds less than the M1 Ultra model. And my unofficial research indicates that's because this uses an aluminum heatsink, while the Ultra uses a heavier and much more expensive copper heatsink. So that's the Mac Studio. Let's take a look at the PC this will possibly be replacing and all the peripherals it'll need to support. My workstation is a 32 core Threadripper and an RTX 2080 Ti, 64 gigabytes of RAM, three terabytes of M.2 NVMe storage, that's the core of the PC that supports my daily content creation workload. However, because it's actually a modular system, I have 14 terabytes of network attached storage, which I can access from any other system on my LAN. And there's a 4K capture card installed. So it's my media capture and streaming PC. It acts as my Steam share game server and my Plex server. And while this is what it is and can only be that, this is very upgradable. If I need more memory, I can double or even quadruple it, more storage, add it. But if I need more graphics horsepower, I can do that. But at this point, the only real upgrade that gives me both more GPU and VRAM is an RTX 3090. And that cost way more than this entire computer. If I want to step up to a new Threadripper, the CPU and motherboard upgrade it would require 
also costs more than this. But because of the limitations of this, I already can't completely replace the full functionality of my workstation with the Mac. So if I do decide to make the switch permanently, I need to come up with another solution for a NAS and a 4K capture system at a minimum. So after I reassembled the Mac, I set it all up. Mac OS Monterey is running, no issues there. I have most of the software I need installed. I disconnected all my peripherals from my PC and connected it to the Mac. And it's all working exactly like it should so far, which is great because honestly, if this stuff doesn't work with the Mac, that's a deal breaker. And to some, that may sound unreasonable, but it's really not. Spending $2,000 on this to potentially replace my PC isn't really a hard pill to swallow, especially in the current market. But spending 2 k on this and needing to replace the setup I spent over a year tailoring to my needs, that pill just got horse size. And I know what Apple would say because their customer support has actually said it to me, only Apple certified peripherals are guaranteed to work on an Apple product, which is, well, Never mind. it's fine for people in the Apple ecosystem, but doesn't go far in trying to bring non-Apple users into that ecosystem because at the end of the day, Apple is supposed to be about the user experience. So honestly, I don't care what this thing looks like. I can stick it in the corner and not look at it. I have to look at these and type on this and quickly lay out my edits in this and EQ my audio listening to these. That's my user experience. I'm accustomed to adapting the platform to my needs, not the other way around. But now let's take a look at some of the performance starting with the hardware speeds and the SSD. First, I'm seeing write speeds are about 1000 megabytes per second slower than an equally specced M1 Max MacBook Pro, but read speeds are about the same. The main purpose of soldered on storage in a laptop is power efficiency, meaning battery life. No battery here, so the trade-off for socketed memory is it's a little bit slower, but it's much more repairable, even if it has to be done at the Apple Store. Plus, the lower write speed isn't really meaningful in any application anyone's using on this computer, and it's still over twice as fast as my Gen 3 SSDs in here. However, because I found two storage slots in the Mac Studio, some viewers have speculated, and I agree that the second slot is likely used in the much larger, like eight terabyte models in a dual SSD striped configuration, which is how the speeds of those are over seven gigs per second. Now, I haven't completely tested all the ports yet. I still have a Thunderbolt 4 dock I plan on running everything through, but the rear Thunderbolt ports and the front type C ports run my external USB flash drives at their max speeds and the SD card reader tests at 250 megs per second. And that's likely due to the limitations of my SD card at this point though, not the reader. So let's get into some performance metrics now and right off the top, Apple compared this to a PC desktop with an Intel i9-12900K and RTX 3060 Ti, but not in raw performance, just in power efficiency. If you look at the slide closely, that Y axis is relative performance, not an actual performance metrics like FPS or cycles per second. Now, in some ways it does match or even exceed the performance of much higher spec PCs, but in just raw computing power, not so much. Now, this Mac up against my $6,000 workstation doesn't seem like a fair comparison, so to be more realistic, I ran the numbers against my very simple $1,000 gaming PC, which is an i5-12400 and an RTX 3050, and those two systems actually trade blows depending on the application. But let's start with where this thing shines, and that's video editing. Apple built an SOC that seems to be purposely built for video editors. The Premiere Pro Puget Bench ran 14% faster on the Mac Studio than on my workstation, and After Effects was almost 51% faster. And my last YouTube video rendered out 27% faster on the Mac in DaVinci Resolve. And for the cherry on top, transcoding a 227 gigabyte 6K Blackmagic RAW video file to X265 for archiving completed 17% faster on the Mac. Now, I'm a Resolve editor, and to be honest, the actual render output time is not usually that important. I mean, no matter how fast I get it out, it's gonna take YouTube forever to process it anyway. More important to me is the working experience in the edit. 
How responsive is the timeline playback and scrubbing? Is there zero lag when EQing my audio? As I stack tracks and fusion elements and correction nodes, does the system start to bog down? Now the tests I run were fairly simple and not too demanding. And just like the M1 Mac mini testing I did, the Macs handle simple edits brilliantly. It's when you start layering in the effects and transitions, time shifting, stabilizing, adding tracking nodes and noise reduction, heavy GPU effects and transition, those things add up quickly and bog down the Apple SoC. So while this is a quick introduction to the Max capabilities within a simple studio setting, I will be devoting an entire extended video on video editing on the Mac Studio. We'll see how far we can push it. Now let's look at the synthetic benchmarks and the Apple's almost year and a half old cores are still impressive with single core performance just stomping my Threadripper. But the new Alder Lake CPUs have knocked some of the shine off of it with one of the cheapest 12 gen CPUs, the i5-12400, surpassing its single core performance in Cinebench by 11.5%. And even with two fewer P cores and no E cores, the Intel CPU comes within 4% of its multi-threaded performance. Looking at straight V-Ray CPU rendering, a process that hasn't been optimized for the Apple Silicon and may never be, and the unoptimized M1 Mac doesn't perform very well here, but Blender 3.1 is optimized for M1, enabling it to pull 5% ahead of the 12400. Unfortunately for the Mac nowadays, most 3D artists, if they're rendering on their desktop or even doing some viewport rendering, are either using GPU hardware rendering or combining both the CPU and GPU to render, and unfortunately, using the GPUs to render the same Blender classroom scene, the M1 Mac falls 60% behind the RTX 3050 and 81% the RTX 2080 Ti. When you look at real-time 3D rendering, the M1 Mac generates 40% less FPS than the 3050 and 60% less than the 2080 Ti in the Heaven benchmark. Now, I know the argument, Nobody should be buying this for gaming, which is true, but someone may be considered buying it for game development using something like Unreal Engine. And the basic rule there is the better the system is at gaming, the better it is at game dev. And I know you have probably seen about a million Tomb Raider benchmarks on this thing. I ran it too. The final number was impressive, falling just 14% short of my gaming PC. But then I actually spent an hour playing the game and it wasn't good. Not just micro scutters and input lag, but full on half second stutters and mouse freezes. Now, several years ago, I would have said that a 10 core CPU with single core performance like this would be perfect for 3D design and animation. However, with so much hardware accelerated features built into 3D software nowadays, if you're a serious 3D artist, you want a system with a dedicated graphic card that can take advantage of those features. But again, just like I did with the Mac Mini, I'll do a full video on a whole bunch of 3D software, especially since more suites are optimized for Apple Silicon, and maybe I'll be surprised. Now, obviously, a low power SoC can't hit same peak performance as a dedicated graphics card. Aside from maybe an obscure unnamed synthetic benchmark, the M1 Max can't match the peak performance of an RTX 3060 Ti. I know marketing teams are supposed to be clever, but I think this slide was an unfortunate mistake because it gives PC guys ammo and misleads potential customers into believing they're buying a product with unrealistic performance expectations. What the takeaway should have been is the M1 Max GPU can outperform the 3060 watt for watt, right? At 40 watts, the RTX card can't even turn on when the M1 Max is chugging away because while I'd say most people don't really care about how much power their desktop computer uses, just as long as it gets the job done, performance per watt is important to many. It is to me. And I'll be honest, this is a bear when it comes to power draw. It idles at over 200 watts, but even at our current utility prices, it only cost me about $200 a year to run. I know people who spend more than that a month at Starbucks. Hi, hon. But with that power comes heat. This thing heats up the studio in the summer so much that I had to get a portable air conditioner to be able to work in here, and that really gets the power meter spinning. This Mac running Cinebench and Heaven simultaneously maxed out at just 82 watts and never even got warm. The air coming out of the back was cool, and it was so quiet it doesn't even register above background on my noise level meter, which is another reason I'm considering replacing this workstation. 
it's loud. I have quiet 140 millimeter fans in there and the slowest fan curve I can get away with, but even when I'm trying to do something as simple as tuning my audio, the fans ramp up to 50 to 55 decibels. So retiring this to a server rack in my cold basement as my new home lab would be great, but only if this meets the standards. And what do I think so far? Well, while I won't be making any ultimate conclusions until I'm done with everything in a month or so, my initial thoughts are first, this thing slaps when it comes to anything that can take advantage of the media engine. Video editing, media encoding and decoding, any application that involves audio and video, there isn't much better for the price. Any single core processor apps, photo editing, vector graphics, productivity tasks, CAD, this is a great little machine for all of that. You can do better with 12th gen Intel, but not at the size, sound and power. Its weaknesses are probably still the same as the M1 Mac Mini, just not as weak. Upgradability is non-existent despite the few modular components. You need to ensure you pick the right version or at least figure it out before the return window closes. Performance wise, I still think any task or application that takes advantage of the power of a dedicated graphics card will suffer slightly on the Apple Silicon. Keeping in mind, however, that the integrated GPU in the M1 Max is better than anything on the desktop side currently from AMD or Intel. Again, just initial impressions, so be sure to get subscribed to catch all the content on this Mac Studio and all my other tech-related content. If you have any questions or want to see any particular tests on this Mac, let me know in the comments. Be sure to hit that like to get this video out to other like-minded folks. I hope to see you in the next one. Until then, stay safe.